Um, is everybody sitting comfortably? Have you all got a cup of tea or something stronger? <laughs> I have the old Darth Vader mug. Uh, Sonny. Coke. Coca Cola. Keep me away. It's getting near my bedtime. I light up at about 10 o'clock. It's only herbal tea that's in it. I only smoke herbal cigarettes, don't worry. So, uh, what a delight uh, it is for me to welcome you, Jim, uh, to uh, the growing, the ever growing Mythical Ireland community. Um, we're all very familiar with your name, uh, and many people, of course, will be familiar with your artwork. Uh, it is. Uh, I was going to say traditional, <laughs> if, if you can count two previous episodes as establishing a tradition. It is traditional for me, first of all, to ask the guest for a little bit of biographical information and uh, as much for my own benefit as anyone else. I wonder if you'd tell us a little bit about your young years, your formative years, you know, where, where were you born, where did you grow up, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I was born in... Uh a nursing home that later became a brothel. It's a good start to life. I was born in the Sunnybank nursing home on, uh, in Glasnevin, opposite Clare's Cigarette Factory. It was a private nursing home. My mum had her own private tutor, so everything was private. And believe me, I'm against something for private these days. <clears throat> so I was born there, and uh, I believe later, <laughs> when I went to research myself, I was told to keep away. Sorry, I... I distracted by the glass is flaring it's annoying me can we get rid of this here have to take them off mm, can't see properly anyway uh when i went back to research my background <laughs> the woman next door to the nursing home when i asked you know was there anybody there i could contact said uh, do you know that was a brothel about 20 years ago and i'm going like um, no but anyway glass nevin was a hub of I think intellectual activity, there's no doubt about it. I grew up on a rough street because we lost all our money when my millionaire father abdicated his responsibilities and left my mother, as she said herself, with two and six in her arse pocket and no house. So we lived with relatives and these relatives were the most extraordinary women. So I was brought up by, you know, about six women, uh, one of whom was my mother, obviously, but she was out working all the time as a fashion buyer. <clears throat> She was very posh, which is never a good idea on a tough street. So I learned quickly to modify my accent to fit in. And uh, it was a wonderful place because no matter what trouble I got into, no matter what trouble people tried to inflict on us, I was with a bunch of women who would kill for me to protect me. So I'm going back to, you know, what we call the cruelty men. I don't want to get into the details of it. Uh, they had these people rounding up stray children and hand them over to pedos. And I remember my mother giving one of them a good solid swack. You know, she wasn't afraid of them. And that brought the whole road together. So I grew up in a very, very sound environment, even though it was very tough. You know, I mean, breakfast was porridge. Dinner was a bit of potato. We might be lucky if we had ham and cabbage. I've hated cabbage ever since, mind you, but there you go. Uh, we even had coddle, sheep's brains, all that kind of crap, you know, but we had obviously, you know, because we were mean and lean, we were very resilient. As a consequence, I'm still here. And following the COVID experience, I'm looking now at India and South Africa and realizing these people are beating the curve. It's going straight down. And it must be for the same reason. Poverty, you know, bad diet, but good diet. In other words, you know, fish, rice, basics. Because I realized I had cancer and I researched a lot of it. And I went from eating no red meat until I was about 18. We had some roast beef in college occasionally. But I'd never eaten a proper steak till I was 18, 19. And then when I started making money, of course, you eat more and more of this stuff. And as the family was growing up, we had a much better diet, I would have thought. <clears throat> but I think that had a lot to do with the way my mind worked as well, because I grew up with a natural empathy for ordinary people who are severely oppressed by the system in this country as they are anywhere. So that turned me into a kind of a quasi-socialist. I went from being very nationalistic because I was brought up in a Catholic school by a Franciscan monks, who I still admire hugely. I'm friends, still friends with the 
well, he was the head of the order, and overnight, here's how the Franciscans work because they're take a vow of poverty. This poor man, who I admired hugely, was the head of the order in Rome, and he's told to pack a suitcase, a single suitcase, and move to the home because he's 84 in Cork. And I thought that was extraordinarily harsh, but he thinks that's part of the package. That's what you sign up for. Yeah. But anyway, those people educated me in a way that we still marvel at. We have a past pupils reunion and, you know, a lot of people, you know, would have heard of De Valera, Elaine De Valera, the grandson was a good mate of mine in school. So he's still around, fortunately. And uh, we all get together every year. We can't last year because of COVID or, you know, hopefully we will next year. And we realized that we were superbly educated in a way that you couldn't imagine. I could translate the Bello Gallico from Latin into Gaelic. Now, I wasn't one of the smart guys. The smart guys could do it in ancient Greek. So it was that level of normal education. This wasn't extraordinary education. This was normal for most kids of my age at that time. Yeah. And that brought me, of course, to the whole history of Latin America, which came in handy when I met the famous Che Guevara. Because he asked a simple barman, uh, how did he know so much about uh, Latin America? And I told him very simply that I was educated by Franciscans and he got it immediately. Because while the first thing he said to me when he came in, and I said this by way of introducing myself because it did create the famous poster that's been doing the rounds forever since. <clears throat> and I was only outed in 2004, but that's another story. But when Che Guevara came into the bar, I recognized him immediately because we'd seen films of the Cuban Revolution on the newsreels in school. And the priests were very supportive of it too, and still are. And long story cut short, Guevara told me he was Irish and I was gobsmacked. Now his English wasn't brilliant. So I said, well, it doesn't surprise me that much now that I think of it. I said, there's a huge Irish diaspora in Argentina. And of course, I was thinking of the Southern Cross, which was run by the the priests who used to uh, educate these guys in Newell's school. Maradona played for Newell's old boys. And then I started off, that was, I didn't mention that stuff, obviously that was later, but I started off with his, the history of the Argentinian Navy for him, which he didn't even know himself. And Ad Admiral Brown, who uh, founded the Argentinian Navy. And believe it or not, it is a new book out called Ireland in Colour. And guess what's in it? A photograph of Admiral Brown. I didn't know such a thing existed, right? Uh, I'm, I went on to talk about the Higgins of Chile. I'm just going to memory now. Who founded Chile and the capital of Higgins is named after him. Santiago is the capital, but like Washington and New York, the proper state capital is O'Higgins, where the parliament is. And I thought of all the people who fought the O'Reillys in Cuba, Bolivar's army with the Irish generals. I was able to give them a good rundown on the Irish in Latin America, which brings me to an interesting one because I came across a wonderful press cutting reading about Maureen O'Hara, who I spoke to once but never actually met. Maureen O'Hara was filming in Havana. And of course, in the hotel she was staying in, filmed, filmed by John Houston, just after the revolution, Che Guevara used to turn up for a coffee every morning with a cigar. And they got talking. And Che pulled the same one he pulled on me like I'm Irish. And she was going like, yeah, right. So they got talking. And she said, after a week of meeting this man from coffee in the morning, she had to say to him, how do you know so much about Ireland? And she, he said, I model myself on Tom Barry and I studied every book on the Irish Revolutionary Wars. <laughs> so that Irish connection is still very valid now. I deal with the Guevara family who are contentious on one side, are hardline commies. And his brother, who's a nutcase, wonderful Irish guy, <clears throat> called Juan Martin after a Juan Martin himself. And Juan Martin said that Guevara Lynch, who the other side of the family kind of dislike, because he was very upper middle class, very Irish, and uh, he drank a lot, let's put it that way. Not too much, but a lot for them. So they kind of zone him, but Juan Martin, his 84 year old brother, this is Shay's brother has said very simply, because Ayala Guevara denied that the family was Irish at a thing, a gig I was doing in County Clare for the Che Guevara festival. She said they were descended from Spanish conquistadors. <laughs> I had to keep a straight face for that one. Anyway, Juan Martin said that Guevara Lynch was Irish and Basque. 
Now, if you know where they came from, it's called Rosario, and it's a rugby playing Irish fraternity. Remember that dad was a dentist, so they were well off. But he said that dad preferred the Irish to the Basque. He said the Basque were wonderful, but they were so serious, right? When they got political, they were too serious. And he said the Irish, when they got political, became funny. And then they got slightly inebriated and became even funnier. And he spent all his time with the Irish in Rosario because of the connection. He was very proud of the Irish connection. So we have that very strong Irish connection with Guevara. But I think the best comment was from a Jewish activist who I worked with on the, uh, the Shea exhibition in 2004. She found out by accident that I was the actual creator of the image. A barman in Los Angeles saw herself and Jonathan Green, the director, and I'll talk about mythical Ireland in a sec, sorry, this is another myth I'm creating. And he looked at the poster for the show and said, oh, I know who did that. And the guy said, oh, the photographer, uh, <clears throat> Corda. He said, no, no, the black and red one. That was an Irish guy called Jim Fitzpatrick. So they were a bit flummoxed because they were having this big opening in a week's time. And here was the creator of the famous poster and nobody ever heard of him. So they rang the Irish embassy and said, we need to get in touch with an Irish artist called Jim Fitzpatrick. And the receptionist said, the fellow did the Che Guevara. <laughs> so the rest is history. They flew me over. I was outed as the creator and now everybody knows because I got tired of trying to explain what the hell it was about. Is know. that how anyway, you became from that, famous? From there on, I was in advertising, I left advertising and started getting absorbed in my favourite preoccupation besides politics, mythology. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you, what, like, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about, you know, your earlier years is when, when was there a moment when you sort of realised, was there a eureka moment or when, when was it that you kind of realised, yes, I want to be an artist. Art is what I'm going to do. And also in conjunction with that, when did you develop your love of mythology? Well, starting with the artist thing, my grandfather was a very famous artist who worked for New York Gaelic American. He worked with the Fenians, with John Devoy. He, he died in 1912 in the beginning of the Great Flu. When all my family were wiped out, except for my grandmother and my mother, luckily. And... Uh, he was known as the cartoon wing of the nationalist movement. He did these really acerbic anti-British cartoons. I have someone I'm going to put up on Facebook, actually, uh, one of an Indian sepoy hanging from a tree and another of a Jew hanging from a tree. One is the British rule in India, the other is the Tsar's rule in Russia. And it's very evocative because it places the two races, the Jewish race and the Irish race, close together for obvious reasons persecution, attempted genocides. We had three of them in our history, you know? They've had more than three or four, I'd say, you know? So that kind of fact that my grandfather was a famous artist, I think it influenced me, it was in the back of my head always that, because I was always drawing. And when I was in primary school, I, I, I drew a whole book, a comic book. And the teacher was so enamored with it, he said, listen, just you stay drawn, I'll just keep talking. And then the same thing happened when in secondary school, I remember a teacher who found me drawing, you know, he had the hand raised to give me a whack. In those days, you were allowed to whack people, especially the neat people like me. And uh, he said, what are you doing, Fitzpatrick? And I said, uh, I was actually drawing, so sorry. And he said, uh, let me see what you're doing. And I felt he expected dirty pictures. So I don't know what he was thinking, but anyway, they were all drawings of, you know, war scenes that I'd seen in comics and stuff like that, Spitfires and Stukas, whatever I felt looked good, you know, looked interesting. And I also noticed that when I was doing all this after class, other kids would come over just to have a look. So maybe it was an attention seeking too, in a way. But the teacher just after a while did the same thing as the other guy said, you just keep doing what you're doing. I'll carry on, you know? So I got away with murder and then they made me editor of the college magazine, right? So I used to work in a dungeon in Gormiston Castle because I went to school in Gormiston. It was the most, the most beautiful castle is still there, actually. And <clears throat> it was a real dungeon. It wasn't a toy dungeon. You, know, you could see the, the lime on the uh, roof with the horse hair still in it from Norman times. And we had a printing press down there and I had to learn how to do printing as well. So when I went for a job in advertising after I left school, I got straight in because I knew more than most kids my age, you know, of simple processes like printing, you know? Yeah. But that, I had a talent. 
was the beginning of mixing with people who broadened my mind. It was a huge diaspora of Dutch, Germans, people left over from the war, who come over here after the war, during the war, and decided not to go home for obvious reasons. And they were highly skilled, and I learned a vast amount from them. English people as well, who'd left England during the war and come over. So I was, that was about 1962, 65. By 67, I was very proficient. I was being very well paid. And then I did the first Shea in 67 when I worked in advertising and the famous red and black one a year later for May 1968 for an exhibition in London. And I was always a political animal, but really my love was mythology. It wasn't politics and it's still the same. I prefer mythology to politics anytime. And I used to go down at lunch hours when I worked in advertising along the bookshops on the canals and on the quays. <clears throat> and I bought a really rough, dirty copy of a book called Keating's History of Ireland. And I remember in the bookshop even, the wave of excitement that hit me, because it was all about the different race who'd come to Ireland, right? Yeah. I'm talking way back in Neolithic times and before, virtually after the Ice Age. And these annals, we knew from our school books, the basic story of the different invaders who came to Ireland, you know, especially, I, I always loved the two of the Dan, because when I was down in Clare, when I was a kid on the farm there with my aunt, they would tell stories of these, but they'd be different from the ones you see in books. It would be the local variant of the children of Lear or something, you know? So I had this magical feeling about the Irish countryside imbued in me, I think by my aunt, who was a kind of quasi mystical woman who ran a farm while her husband worked. And like, she had pet cows, pet geese, pet everything. And they followed her around like, the Pied Piper. I was fascinated by stuff like that. I'd never seen that before. I had a cow, sorry, a calf I used to ride on, right? I go around thinking I was an effing cowboy and I was very slow on a calf. I very rarely took off. And when it did, it was like trouble. It was quite sore. It wasn't like a horse. But anyway, imbued with this kind of mysticism and then educated in college, like I remember the first time I learned the Children of Lear, it was hammered into me in primary school by a teacher who used to wrap us with that big six uh, leather strap thing, you know, the six inch, six layers of it. And he'd say, be re in Aaron fa do daravanam lear. That means there was a king in Ireland long ago called lear. And we'd have to say, in unison, be re in Aaron fa do daravanam lear. And the next sentence, and if we missed the beat, it was <laughs> So, I say you were a quick learner. All, it was all sorts of learning, but that wasn't my favourite. But what I'm saying is, somewhere in the middle of all this, the reality and the beauty of Irish and Celtic myths and legends just started kicking in, and I became obsessed. So when I got Keating's History of Ireland, I devoured it, because that had that's a compilation of books, some of which are long lost. It was written about the 1640s. It was a compilation yeah. of books called Kindrama Snapta which is the Book of the White Cow, which is lost forever. There's sections of the Tawn that are gone forever too. The Stave Book, written on, it was supposed to be written on bore, on uh, wood. We have Larna Hudra, which I've studied at great length. I've been shown the original copy of the Book of Leinster. And I have translations from the Royal Irish Academy of all the other stories. So I'm still writing all this stuff. I've written, three, I've translated three quarters of the Tawn. Nobody's ever seen it because I have to finish it one day. And I'm running out of time, as you can see, you know, I'm 75 now. So that love and that fanaticism has stayed with me. You know? Well, I'm not surprised to hear that, Jim, because there is so much material. There's literally several lifetimes if you're mm. sort of in, in, immersed in it. Very impressed with the uh, li linguistic talents, by the way. Uh, I'm glad to say that by the time I was in school, the Christian brothers had stopped, just only recently stopped teaching Latin uh, as a subject. Do you have a favourite? Irish myth or a favourite Irish mythical character? Maybe that's two questions. Oh, absolutely. The, my favourite myth, mythological period <clears throat> is the early Irish literature period. And that is the very earliest period recorded in our annals. It's the story of the indigenous people. Nobody likes when I say this, the North African former who inhabited this country long before any of the white fellas are freckly fellas. I used to be a redheaded freckles, by the way. We come from a place called Mesopotamia. That's where my genetic forebears come from. And only Jews, Irish, and Scots, and some uh, South Ossetians in Russia 
have the red hair, hair in the, those huge numbers, but essentially it comes from Mesopotamia. So we had an indigenous population after the Ice Age, and during the Ice Age, as we know, because bare bones have been found in caves in Alwi, and this enterprising student about 10 years ago took them out of the box to have a look at them and found they'd been carved. Somebody had sawn the meat off them. Yeah. And this was thousands of years before we're supposed to have been inhabited. Yes. So an Inuit style people were living here of some kind in caves, hunting the local wildlife, which is essentially bears, anything they could eat, boxes, the works. So that's kind of sparked interest in me as well. But long story cut short, our annals describe the taking of Ireland, Largo Wall, at the Book of the Conquest of Ireland. Five raids, there were five invasions. And the pattern is very much like the Jewish pattern of the Holy Land. These people were expelled from Ireland by the indigenous Fomorians and the Fomor. I think we, Bob Quinn in his book Atlantean has shown that North Africa, Tunisia, that area is exactly similar in terms of music, in terms of genetic uh, distribution of certain types of chromosomes. So we have links with North Africa, whether we like it or not, and I'm very proud of them. And, the, you know, he also played Irish music. He played uh, Berber music. An interesting connection is the Tuareg, the blue people. I call the blue people because they wear black and the indigo goes through into their skin. There's no word in Gaelic for a black person. They're called Dina Gurum, which comes from the blue people, you know, Gurum being blue. So that whole diaspora, you might say, was connected to Ireland somehow, came to Ireland as they thought to retake the land, were defeated eventually by the Fomorians, who are probably Moorish, I think, from the sounds of their words, <clears throat> driven back. They fought, we know from uh, history in the uh, Trojan Wars, because they're mentioned, the Danaeans, the Danaeans. And then whatever happened after that was a great displacement and they all decided they were going to come back and take Ireland back. It wasn't called Ireland then, it was called the Woody Isle because the story was that a squirrel could go from the north of Ireland to the south of Ireland and not ever hit the ground. There were so many trees, you know. And these people came and they took over the previous two races who had come to Ireland, the Fear Bulg and the Fear and the Galleon and the Fear Down. And they were all agriculturalists. They brought agriculture to Ireland, right? The people who took over from them and defeated them, the two of they done them, were a warlike race. There, you know, there's mentions of places like Scythia where they came from. I think they came from Northern Greece, Macedonia, but they were already a diaspora from Ireland that went back to that area and then decided to return. Just like the promised land, because Ireland was their promised land. So all this stuff fed into me when I was young. And you can see the result. I've written two books. I've three written, but I've only published two. One was the Book of Conquest. And the second was the Silver Arm. And it tells the story of that particular race that I identify with for the simple reason that they were the first redheads to come to Ireland and the first fair-skinned people. There seem to be a favourite among many other sort of students of mythology or people who are enthusiastic about Irish myths seem to latch on to the two other Damon quite a lot. So apart from your own sort of personal connection, what do you think is the broader appeal of the Tua de Danon compared, well, compared to every, everyone else? Just to go backwards, I was always as a kid fascinated by the Tua de, Tua de Danon. <clears throat> and the huge motivating factor in my decision to start writing about them, translating the, uh, the books, the annals, and illustrating them as well, was because in our history books at that time, and it hasn't changed that much, there was literally half a page devoted to the very earliest, you know, inhabitants of Ireland, right? That's the way I remember it too, yeah. Yeah, we only trace Ireland back to Brian Baru and the Miletians, supposedly, because they're quasi-historical and they've left traces. But the earlier history, I find fascinating. And it's like the Bible. There's loads of bullshit, but there's also vast amounts of truth and archaeological truth. And the same is with the annals and the, uh, scripts, the scripts that I read. For instance, I'll give you a simple example. When the Milesians came here, they came by a circuit, sorry, I'll explain who the Milesians are first. 
They're the ones that Brian Boru and all the high kings of Ireland took their lineage from and the royal family of Britain. They all traced themselves back to one man, Milesius, and one woman, Scota. Scota gave her name to the Irish race, the Scoti, which the Scots are derived from. They were the Alba, they were the Picts. They became the Scoti when Ireland and Scotland joined together in Dalriada. But anyway, we were known as the Scots. The Irish were invented in medieval times as a reaction against the English to distinguish ourselves from the Scots. And it was in Louvain that that particular drama happened, mostly through a man called Gagan, Gohagan Gagan, who gave us a, a huge history of Ireland and described us as a different race from the Scotty, the Scots, even though we were born Scotty. Now, Scota is an interesting character, one of the great characters of Irish mythology, because she was the daughter of a pharaoh. And all these events, if you read history and study history like I do, coalesce with the downfall of Athenaka and around that time period. And my own particular theory is, because there's so many links between the beliefs of Athenaka and the beliefs of the Irish at that time. Remember, the Irish worshipped the sun god only. That was Athanakan's crime. That's why they destroyed every statue and every picture of him after he died and got rid of his religion and made King Tut his son, uh, the pharaoh. Ireland was monotheistic, believed in the one God, just like Athanakan, and that came from only one source. Before that, we worshiped dozens, right? Crom Cruach being the classical example. You know? And when St. Patrick came to Ireland, he found there's a monotheistic people. Oshin and Patrick had a, a conversation where Oshin said, what use is your God if you can't see him? And Patrick said, well, you can't see your God either. And he said, oh, yes, we can. And he pointed to the sun, you know. The sun was God and it gave us warmth, it gave us everything, you know. So we have this period when Irish history suddenly becomes historical with St. Patrick. And people may not know this, but up to the time of my favourite Pope, John Paul the first, John Paul Second, the liberal pope, not no, John Paul the First. I'm getting them mixed up with the Polish guy, the guy with the big nose, a really kind man, and he decided to regularize the Irish saintly calendar, <laughs> and he got rid of all our pagan gods. We had 365 saints, which were then turned. There were pagan gods turned into saints, and he got rid of them. And I've never been disappointed in him. Otherwise, he's a great pope. But that really annoyed me because St. Patrick cleverly decided that these were a very religious people and that they were longing for the presence of God. So his manner of bringing God to them was to deify every one of the pagan gods. Right? And I don't like calling them pagan because they weren't pagan. They believed in God in a different manner. So we, you might say we found Christianity, which was a wonderful benefit to Ireland. It wasn't the Christianity we know from. Victorian and Catholic Ireland, you know, which was a predatory Christianity. Christianity back then was an extraordinary, what's the word for it? Extraordinary set of beliefs that we accepted and that we improved on, I think, and that we exported to England, to uh, Europe during the Dark Ages. Well, I'll give you a good example of an Irish monk abroad. <clears throat> I know I'm veering off mythology. One of my favorite saints is St. Gal. St. Gal's Monastery, and I have the plans for it, there's a book of the plans, are beautiful, they're like a Celtic manuscript. He built his vast monastery in uh, Switzerland and converted to Helvetii, a very, very vicious Gaelic tribe, right? Or Celtic tribe, I should say. Now, the reason he converted to Helvetii was that he arrived with his 12 monks, because like uh, St. Columbanus in Columba, you had 12 followers with you, like Jesus had. Unfortunately, when Helvetti saw him coming, they ran because they were wearing the long robes. They had the Celtic tonsure, later forbidden by the church, right? Which is a shaved head and long hair down to their waist. They wore red lipstick and blue eye makeup. So <laughs> you're dealing with a colorful people, and then they face another colorful people who look at them at first in fear and then realize we're all on the same wavelength here. And that's how St. Gaul succeeded. So going back to the very early uh, Irish myths and legends, 
you see the voyage of Columbus, Columbanus, as, as mythology. Now we know from Tim Severn and explorers like him, it's part history. If you go back and look at the connection between Irish mythology, Irish names, and the indigenous Indians of North America, the indigenous people, I should say, not Indians. Crazy Horse, when he was a boy, was called Setanta. Now, who else was called Sedanta in Irish mythology? Who Cullen himself? The first city that Cortes attacked on the Utican Peninsula was called Cucutlan. And when they saw the Spaniards coming, they thought it was, I believe, Irish missionaries coming back with the white beards. That's how they got sucked into being defeated, you know, but there's other reasons for that as well. But that's medieval mythology. But it's all based on the truth. You can presume now that it's 90% certain that St. Columbus did get to America. It's been proven by Tim uh, Severin. Now in America, they're finding all these Celtic ruins like barrows and dolmens. There's one in Quebec, a friend of mine has just sent me, which is spectacular. And it's just in the middle of an island with nobody on it. We get back to the stories of the very earliest invasions of Ireland, and we find that historically they fit in. I mentioned Scotha, who gave her name to our race. We know where her grave is. So a pharaoh's daughter's grave is in Ireland, never been excavated. So I find the link between mythology and the elements of truth fascinating now as I'm getting older. There were greatest fairy tales. There were greatest myths and legends. But when you see there's a bit of history in them telling us who we are and where we're from, then it gets really interesting for me. You know? My, my first cousin is a geneticist, by the way, the most famous geneticist in Europe at the moment, in terms of things. And uh, she helps me with a lot of this stuff as well. You know? Well, in the past decade, we've re revealed, it's been revealed by geneticists that, in fact, the belief of the common Irish people that we were descended from the Gael, as in the Milesians, uh, was actually true. And uh, our, overturning the contention of the scholars pre, prior to the past seven or eight years, uh, when when the belief was that we were actually descended from the uh, you know the Mesolithic uh, people who were here uh, immediately after the Ice Age and possibly during the Ice Age, as you rightly pointed out earlier on. Um, Jim, just in an effort to move things on, because believe it or not, we've over half an hour has flown oh, by sorry. already. Um, I'm, I'm going to just start throwing a few of the viewers' questions at you, if you don't mind. Uh, John John Match on Facebook wants to know. Uh, and I think you mentioned a third book there that's not published, but he wants to know when is your next book? Uh, when is it going to be published? <clears throat> Probably never. <laughs> My kids are at me to do a load of books because I have so much material. <clears throat> I was published by a very famous publisher called Paper Tiger, who went bust and left me with a, you know, a huge debt. And that turned me off publishing. I did two books with them, The Book of Conquest and The uh, Silver Arm which were like, they sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And again, I found to a, a third party that myself and all the other artists and writers who'd worked for this company had been robbed of huge numbers of royalties because they printed them in Singapore and never told us, right? So that kind of put me off publishing. So I went back to publishing myself. My first two books were published by me. And then the one after The Silver Arm, was Aaron Saga, a complete co compilation of my work. I published that, I published portfolios. But one of the problems is, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a solo artist. The back room behind me here is stuffed with prints, rolls, everything, because I live off the internet. My son in LA and my daughter in Milan and myself all work together. My son runs the whole website, right? He's taken over all the packaging. So is Suzanne, but I still have to do a fair bit of it when I get special orders and stuff like that. So now I have more time to do my own thing. But when you're an artist and when you have children, it's a different dynamic, with, you know, if you're the hermit sitting in a garret, you know, you have responsibilities. So I was very lucky, I earned enough money at the right time with publishing, with everything else, especially working for Tim Lizzie, which was great 
honor and a gold mine because they played so well. I was able to educate my children and bring them to the point of, you know, let them loose on the world, you know. And uh, like my daughter's my best friend. We talk every day. She was here for two weeks at Christmas. Having done two tests to make sure she wouldn't kill me with coronavirus from Milan. But my son can't get home at the moment. He's in LA, which is a dangerous spot. And so is Ireland a dangerous spot at the moment. But long story cut short, I decided I didn't want to get back into publishing books. So I've made that decision. A number of publishers have approached me over the years to do a, you know, a big coffee table book. But my instincts, if I'm going to do a book, are going to be to do, if I was going to do a book like that, I'd do it in installments so people could afford it. I don't want one of these big $99 books sitting on my shelves, you know. I suppose I'm snobbish about stuff like that because I came, I grew up in a rough background and realized people have to work for their money. So I always feel, you know, the least I can do is make sure they're rewarded if they're going to spend their dollar on me. And I do that with the prints a lot. You know, I always throw something free into every single order. Yeah. I never tell anybody. You know? Yeah. Um, Joan McHugh wants to know, have you ever based any of your paintings on live art, as in nudes or posed models, or do you paint them entirely from your imagination? Oh, no, I can talk only about one person because it's a personal matter. <clears throat> My best friend is a woman now, 40, I've got to be careful of the age. <laughs> Women don't like their age given away. Let's say she's mid 40s. And I've been painting and drawing and working with her since she was about 17, 18. And we are still best friends. We've never had any relationship, but we are closer than sister and brother, if you can imagine that. And uh, she's been an inspiration and a muse because I've, I've been working on a project for years called Mostly Women, which is a kind of a take on the fact that I grew up in a world of women. I worked in advertising where, for the first time in my life, I noticed every advertising agency I worked in had a harasser that we all knew about. And we'd warn, you know, the girls we worked with about them. We got to the point where actually I threatened one guy and he had to leave the agency because he tried it on with one of my own staff. I had a group of five women working with me and I didn't want them perturbed by this kind of crap. But you become aware that the world is one-sided and it's heavily weighed against women. Now, I don't care how many statues you enact to give them equality. Until men start having babies and periods and menopause, we're not going to have equality, you know? So they must be given an advantage somehow. But I don't want to get into that. It's a whole different argument. Sorry. No, that's okay. I mean, we've just had, while we're on the subject, we've just had in the past, uh, well, in the past week and a bit, we've had St. Bridget's Day. And quite a lot of focus has been brought around the possibility of making St. Bridget's Day a national holiday because, you know, it is, it is. I mean, there's something there that's reflected in the traditions and in the history and in the mythology that the women get overshadowed. I mean, isn't it the case that Bridget was a contemporary of Patrick and yet she's completely overshadowed by him, enormously eclipsed by him? Well, this only happened, you might say, let's go back to the foundation of my meat. Minut was founded to regularize the Irish Catholic Church and it became the most conservative bastion you could imagine. <clears throat> because the popes of the time, Pope Innocent V, for instance, brought in all these diktats that had nothing to do with Catholicism or Christianity or anything. They were just arbitrary, like the Pope is infallible. Well, Jesus never claimed to be infallible, but this, well, the Pope doesn't know, but the other popes did. And they brought in this narrow conservatism that was more related to a Victorian ideology than anything to do with Christianity. So we went from being a hugely, I won't say, female-centered church to an all-male establishment that was deeply oppressive. If you, you've heard of Sheila and the gigs, right? Now, I don't want to show you what they do because, you know, it's regarded as obscene. These obscene carvings of women holding their vaginas open were over churches as symbols of fertility. They did not regard sex as sinful. Even pedophilia, to give you a quick example, there was a famous case in the annals where a pedophile had sex with a very underage girl. They think because the age is everybody died young then, she would have been about nine, he would have been about maybe about 20, we don't know. 
But that monk was put in a cell for 15 years and not allowed leave. So don't tell me they didn't know about it. And when that monk was released, himself and the abbot and another burly attendant walked him down the main street of the village so he could, you know, go on his knees and atone for his crimes. Right? You did not do that to women. There's another case of O'Connor, the ruler of Connacht, blinding a rapist. That was the punishment. So Irish views on women back then in the Christian church were very protective and very severe if anybody dared harm one. Now, going back further, the early Irish church in St. Bridget. St. Bridget was a goddess who had a cult, the cult of breed. It was a healing cult. So obviously they were like nurses or something in their time. Healers, because healers were highly valued. Miak the healer was the one who put the silver arm back on Nuada, right, when he lost his arm. When St. Patrick came, I have, now I'm only guessing, but based on my knowledge, that he simply took one look at the cult of breathe and said, next one is going to be Bridges, a nun. So it became a society of nuns. And obviously the next nun who was St. Bridget, because it was successive, he became Bridget, 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 different people, was obviously a great healer and a cult developed around her as a saint. So we want to have, there used to be St. Patrick's Day and then St. Sheila's Day in medieval times. St. Sheila was St. Patrick's wife. That's where right. the Sheila thing comes from. Mm. That got dropped. So we feel, because I'm part of her story, we feel that we should have a feast day honoring women. And that would be St. Bridget's Day. Because Bridget is the great healer, she's both Christian, she's both pagan, and I don't like the word pagan, she's pre-Christian, and she was a goddess. <clears throat> and I just think she sums up the contradictions of Ireland and of our psyches and of our attitudes towards women at the same time. So it's a good excuse to use St. Bridget's Day to celebrate women. And that's what we've started doing. You know? But to make it a national holiday, I don't think it's going to take long. Yeah, I think there it's seems to be a... An open, it's kicking an open door. The government have no problem with... Yeah, there's no, an appetite for it now, yeah. Uh, uh, of course, I'm, I'm inclined to think we'd also be sort of reintroducing a proper celebration around in bulk, the beginning of spring, and perhaps something pre-Christian. By the way, we share that in common, Jim. I don't like the word pagan. I find it a pejorative term, and I tend to say pre-Christian rather than pagan. <laughs> It suggests ignorance, and those people were anything but ignorant. Right, absolutely. You um, have to spend 12 years learning by rote the entire history of his people before he learned all the magical stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> they spent years in training. Lorraine Comerford wants to know, she knows that uh, COVID is uh, obviously in interrupting a lot of this stuff, but uh, do you do visits to secondary schools or art demonstrations? No, because I'm useless. <laughs> have you ever done or is it is that the girl who I mentioned as my muse <clears throat> convinced me to go around to her school to give a talk and I had all these school girls right in a girls school across the road from me with the teacher there is an old friend of mine and I thought I was playing a blind I was answering all the questions and obviously they'd set me up because one of them said to me and Mr. Fitzpatrick, what's it like painting a naked girl? <laughs> You've never seen me go beetroot in my life. <laughs> I couldn't talk, my tongue went dry. I thought, what do you say? You can't answer that. This is a Catholic school. It's school girls. Do you know what I mean? I didn't want to win pedo of the month or something, whatever goes on there. So I just said, listen, I don't talk about that aspect of my work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never thinking I'm never doing this again. <laughs> first, first and last time. Huh? <laughs> Total setup. And of course, the girls, you could see them with their, they weren't laughing, but you could see their necks going red and their ears going red as they tried to keep it in. Yeah. The, the next question is about women in mythology, and you may have sort of strayed towards an answer already. Mary Potter wants to know, well, first of all, she says her favourite uh, uh, 
woman from your art is Boan, the goddess of the River Boyne. Yeah with her Irish wolfhound. And this inspired me, says Mary, to contact the OPW and working with them, we brought Irish wolfhounds back to Newgrange for the first time in numbers for perhaps around a thousand years. Jim, of all the women in Celtic mythology, which one inspires you the most and why? Sorry, just to get back, I didn't know about the wolfhounds up in Newgrange. That's yeah, brilliant. A few, a few solstices ago, it was fantastic. And they've been coming back. Obviously the last solstice, there was no public there. But one of the biggest thrills of my life was with uh, that strange man, Charlie Hoy, our Taoiseach, right? And Charlie Hoy rang me up and I thought it was a wind up, you know what I mean? But anyway, long story good short, I went up to him and he had the Book of Conquests, right? And the silver arm on his bookshelf and showed it to me. And he said, you don't know this, but you inspired me to bring the sea eagles back to Inishvik alone. I've always been proud of that, right? Because the book, of conquest and silver armor told through to and the reincarnated sea eagle. To and Macau. Somebody else saw one of my paintings and brought wolf hands back to Newgrange. All I want are wolves back in Ireland, you know, and maybe even bears. How about a few black pigs? <laughs> Boars would be great, but I mean, they kill every boar that comes into Ireland now. Do you know that? They hunt them down and kill them, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so. A lot of species. Is, is there a woman other than Bridget who greatly inspired you? You're asking me about goddesses and... <clears throat> okay, Your work okay. is full of them, in fairness. Is it hard to choose one? No, the Morrigan by a mile, absolutely. I was trying to think, is there anybody else beside Morrigan? The Morrigan is a triple goddess, a war goddess, a love goddess, and a healer. There's different aspects of her, but essentially she's like the Valkyrie. She sort of escorts you to your grave the hard way, you know? Somehow that doesn't surprise me as a man who was raised by a load of women. I imagine <laughs> you encountered the different aspects of the Morrigan as a youngster. None yeah. of them ever turned into crows and pecked me head off or my eyes out, you know, which is what happened to all of them. Yeah. Uh, Teresina oh, Fitzpatrick, who, sorry, who's, who's an artist, uh, wants to know, have you ever done any art on Grania Whale? I have indeed. I painted Grania Whale. I did a series of Les Isles, the islands of Ireland, for an exhibition in Paris. And one of them was Clare Island, the home of Grania Whale. You know, I love Grania Whale. I live near Holt Castle. I don't know if you know the story of Grania Whale coming to Holt. She pulled up her fleet in, in Holt Harbour. In those days, you know, Holt has been, I suppose, the earliest raiding port for an Isle of the Nile hostages sailed from. We were Viking long before the Vikings, you know. So when the Vikings came here, they were simply absorbed. Never mind the bullshit, you know. Everywhere around here is half Viking. Every one up here is half Viking. And up in the castle, Oak Castle, are the family, the St. Lawrence's, who unfortunately have only just sold the castle. They've been here since Viking times, right? Grania Wales strolled up the main road, a path up to Oak Castle. They let her in and they refused her hospitality. So as a consequence, she kidnapped their son. Every time that family sat down because they've been up there, they set a place for a stranger. But that doesn't happen again. So that's drawn your way. And then after that, Queen Elizabeth decided, you know, and decreed that this woman was a pirate because she was raiding all the Spanish and all the English ships as they went to, to America, the New World. <clears throat> Grania Whale got in her Curragh fleet and sailed up the Thames well, how she even got across the Irish Sea, but she was an Atlantic raider, so she obviously could sail. But my God, that's some feat. She sailed up into the port of London and parked her fleet at the Thames, where she was promptly arrested along with her crew. Queen Elizabeth, meantime, heard about this. This is Queen Elizabeth I, right? And she was so intrigued, she asked to meet her. So Grania Whale, with her flaming red hair, and her coloured cloak strolled up to the Queen, didn't genuflect, didn't bow, and nodded to her. And Elizabeth nodded back. She was a redhead as well. <sighs> and they got on famously, and Grania Whale got licensed to pirate the western coast of Ireland. So Grania Whale is an interesting. Extraordinary woman. U Una Sheehan on Facebook. Uh, we're going back to Bowan here. Una says, would you ask Jim 
about his visualization of Boan as a dark haired lady in front of Newgrange. Shouldn't the iconography reflect the Boan of myth being the white cow moon goddess and therefore fair haired rather than dark haired? There are many aspects of Boan. I painted Boan twice. The first Boan I ever painted was the cow goddess, the fair goddess, the fair haired goddess. That painting, incidentally, was bought by George R.R. R. Martin. You know, the guy who wrote Game of Thrones, who I got to know very well when we were both guests of honor at Worldcon last, last year before last. But the bone that I drew is what I call the second bone. I was trying to represent races. I tried to represent, there's three races in Ireland. There's the dark, more shallow skinned, early Irish, the indigenous Irish, you might say. There's the lighter skinned, freckly faced, people like myself when I was young. And then there's the blonder, more Nordic Scandinavian types. And there's three distinct races portrayed, but the early Irish one is portrayed in a number of different ways. And I was trying to catch, capture that in the one of Bowen in front of Newgrange, because that's, you know, her patch. The Boyne is named after right beside it, the Boyne Valley, after Bowen. And also, to, I was trying to make her more of a warrior woman like more than, than a goddess. So that's why I have her, her carrying a sword and with the wolfhound. And it's just, what's the right word? It's a fiction, but a deliberate fiction. I wanted to create something extraordinarily beautiful. So I don't read the histories ex exactly as they should be read. I will when I'm doing Morrigan, because again, to represent Morrigan as a war goddess only would do her no justice. But that's probably the angle I'll take. I've already done the very romantic version of it. You know? It's really interesting, Jim. Just a moment ago, you used the term woman warrior. And, and I just want to tell you why that's really interesting. In the past week, I've been reading a story that I never read before. It's called Arnia Fingen, Fingen's Night Watch. It's about a series of miracles that happen in conjunction with the birth of Con Cade Cahoc, Con of the Hundred uh, Battle oh, at Tara. And in that... There's a description that the Boyne will be formed tonight, right? The whole story about Boan. And she is described by an Irish word that translates exactly as the words you've just used as a warrior woman. The well, warriors were preeminent. Look at Queen Maeve. I mean, I hate to think of many husbands she bumped off. I mean, she killed her husband, Alan, you know, and then offered the King of Ulster the warmth of her ties in exchange for the Bull of Cooley. Yes. So she was not slouch, you know, and there's plenty of women like that. Even up to Norman times, the <laughs> Celtic warrior woman from Wales, when they attacked Waterford, took great exception to the fact that her husband had been killed and slaughtered a hundred men and threw them over the cliffs. You know? Now, that was a real woman, Alice of Aberystwyth, right? A Celt, but a different Celt from us, Welsh Celt. Because we were invaded, you must remember, not by the English, but by Celts from Brittany, from Normandy, and from Wales. They were the first invaders because they came here as allies of Dermot McMurray. We won't get into that history. It was real history. But the concept of a warrior woman, Scottock trained Cú Chulainn, great warrior trainer, was a woman. So we have tons of examples of warrior women. And now we have burials in Europe of warrior women. It's fascinating. The myth of the shield maiden is no longer a myth. These women fought. We know this. In Vikings, they portrayed them. Now they have the archaeology to go with that. Fascinating stuff. Two more questions, Jim. If, if, you, if, you, if you don't mind, we might take one or two live questions then. Uh, Mariana Dunn says, what kind of impact does Jim think his fantasy books have on promoting interest and the retelling of Irish myths and folklore in Ireland? Are you having uh, I hope they have as much an influence as the first book I read on Celtic myths and legends by Eileen O'Fuelan. And it had a huge effect on me. This is Sean O'Fuelan's wife, I think. And I think it was called Celtic Myths and Legends. It had a cover because I got it from Condor Library when I was about eight or nine. <clears throat> it had a cover by a very famous Dutch artist called Carl Ullman. And it had a massive effect on me. I was enamored by it. At that point, I knew my Be Re and Erin Bado, Darabandam Lear off by heart. 
But here was a book with a whole story that wasn't going to be beaten into me that I could read at my leisure. And that book, I think, sparked a huge amount of interest in me. And I was from Condrell, I Yeah, this is one of the difficulties when, when you're dealing with Irish and Celtic mythology is that outside of the artwork that the likes of yourself has created, it's very difficult to sort of visualize a lot of the characters of mythology and the scenes. The last question I have on the sheet is from an artist, Sean Fitzgerald. Sean wants to know if you have an essential philosophy that guides your work. I had a powerful philosophy when I was younger. There's no doubt about that. A political one, which directed me in the area of working. I did work with Martin, uh, Martin Luther King's widow. I did posters of Martin Luther King, Angela Davis, Malcolm X, all these people I was involved with the Black Panthers. They found their way onto a Tin Lizzie album cover, by the way, called Nightlife. <laughs> But that's a whole new story. <clears throat> I was telling Chuck D, you know, the famous Chuck D. I was telling him the story about that and his hair stood up. He thought it was hilarious. And Niles, what's his name? From Chic, Nile Rogers. Uh, learned the story only recently as well about that. He was one of the Black Panthers back in the day, you know. Anyway, what was the question? Sorry. You have an my philosophy. philosophy, yes. That was my political philosophy. <laughs> but I've been driven by a love of Irish legends and a need that goes so deep down it's not true to get young people in Ireland interested and that was my hard yeah. motivation from day one and if I've succeeded in doing that I am deliriously happy but what I do love is I have two grandkids who are into all this not being forced to my kids are my own children into it. they're all grown up now and so many young people when they get to know who I am are fascinated to learn more. And now we have not just me, but loads of other people working in this area. And I hope it inspired them. But what I would love to think I've done is I would love to think above all else that I brought the very earliest Irish myths and legends back to life. Mm. That, is, that would be a huge accomplishment. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful work. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to acknowledge <laughs> that you've had influence um, and a great acknowledgement of that is the fact that when I mentioned that you were going to be on the uh, on the discussion, uh, a lot of people got very excited, uh, being aware of your uh, lifelong passion and interest uh, in the mythology. Uh, so we're very grateful to you, Jim, for everything that you've done in that regard. You're a great ambassador for our old stories, and it's interesting to hear you uh, so eruditely uh, bring us through the history. We'll, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. I'd love to have you back for another discussion. There's a whole other discussion there around the Annals and Geoffrey Keating and, you know, all, all of the, the pre-Christian mythology and the veracity of it and the basis of it in, in real events, because time unfortunately flies when we're uh, having such fluid conversation uh, and we're very glad that you've joined us. One today. last thing, if you're wondering why I'm looking like this, I've decided I'm not going to shave my beard or cut my hair until I get vaccinated. And my kids are saying, please, Dad, get a cut. No. Well, I've been doing DIY hair cutting with, with just a, a shaver. So I did, I did for months and then I thought, damn it, I'm not Never, doing this anymore. It's like we understand uh, the the scenario that we are faced with is uh, unprecedented in the modern era and uh, well this is one way that we've managed to cope very well is gathering together and telling stories and something that you know seems to have really struck a chord with I mean you'll see from the community hopefully a couple of them will ask you a question now we have people from all parts of Ireland but we have viewers from the UK and Europe we have Australians and New Zealanders and we have people from all over the United States and Canada and South America and it's just a wonderful thing that we're gathering together and just retelling the old stories and it just seems to have lit a candle for people in the darkness uh, so for your wonderful contribution to that thank you I'm sure I speak on everyone's behalf Hey everybody, thank you very much for listening and spending time. If if we can take one or two live questions, Jim, if you wouldn't mind hanging on for a bit, two or three. Oh, can I run out and get a glass of water because I'm going dry here? Of course. Dry here. Of course. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if anybody has their hands up. Kevin Riley, I think, is indicating that he would like to ask a question. So hang on, can I just take... Um, let me just have a quick look. Uh, Joan McHugh. Kevin. Can you hear me? Uh, is that Kev uh, Kevin, is it? Hi. 
Yeah, I can hear you fine, Kevin. Uh, just wait. I just want to see if there's one. Is there one more person who'd want to ask a question? We might try and chance three. I know Jim's under a bit of pressure for time. No, just the two, is it? Okay. Oh, it's only the tape in the United match. <laughs> I have to confess. <laughs> Now we know. <laughs> um, Kevin, Kevin Riley has a question for you, Jim, if you don't mind. Hi, Kevin. Thanks very much, Anthony. Uh, good evening, Jim. Thanks for, uh, uh, for this uh, wonderful presentation this evening. Um, I studied uh, Celtic studies up in Aberdeen University, and it was pointed out that, that St. Adaman, who wrote the life of Colum Keel, uh, St. Columbus, in about 715, um, he described a, a journey of St. Colum uh, Columbus going up the, the Great Glen up into the north of Scotland. And he said that when Colum Keel wrote the Gospels, sparks flew from his fingers. And after when he made the journey up Loch Ness, he banished a monster out of the loch. Yeah. And then when he got up to the north of Scotland, he blew down the gates of the king of uh, uh, the Fortred. And then he had a, a battle with the, his arch druid, a guy called Brochen. And That's it was pointed right. out yep. to me that this guy, Colin Keel, is not an ancient hist you know, an ancient mythological mythological figure. He actually existed, but within 120 years, he's been described in the same way as Cahoolan. Okay. Absolutely. There is a natural it. tendency to, to turn historical figures into mythological figures and attribute to them things that we know that didn't happen. The uh, problem with Colin uh, is, is that he was so extraordinary. He's, he's, he's buried in Bobbio under the most beautiful uh, but, uh, carving. You and know, he it, went it struck from Ireland to America to Scotland and then ended up spreading the Gospels in Italy. Yeah. And but, then uh, the it, struck, it, it struck, struck me that too. I was listening to Anthony on uh, the prehistory guys recently, and they were talking about the DNA, DNA analysis from some of the bones in uh, New Grange. And, uh, you know, one of the things that Anthony said is, as much as this is mythology, there is actually some sort of reality. There is some Absolutely. real history that's actually within these. Uh -huh. In the same way as that, you know, this um, this story that's recounted about Colin Keel, it, that has very quickly become, uh, you know, mythologicalized. Uh, to how much extent is that, you know, these Irish mythology? How much ex to to what extent is that actually based in reality? Is the does it actually reflect something real, or is it completely just you know fairy stories, havers? Yeah. The Bible is very like the Bible. <clears throat> the Bible is the most studied book in history. The archaeology of the Bible is probably the greatest archaeological events that we know of because they've discovered direct links, right? And it's the same with Irish mythology. It's history turned legend. So in other words, St. Columbanus or Columbus, Columbanus goes up to Loch Ness, mm -hmm. the monster appears, right? And I believe this is probably what happened. And being a religious man, he probably knows the myths and legends of Ireland and a legend called the Dawaku, which is like this huge, huge sea dog, they called it. Thought this is more of the same, and did what they do in Ireland, they start shouting at it. So he held up his cross and started roaring at the monster. <laughs> and the monster looked around holy and went back. So I imagine there's basis for some of the stuff. Blowing down the doors of a fort, you know, somebody obviously let him in. <laughs> you know, it was highly improbable that he would have been, you know, accepted into that society unless he did something to convince them to open their doors and let him in or to his trouble coming. Maybe so Barry should Nessie out the lock help, Luke, huh? Yeah, I think you get a point where there's real stories there, but to mythologize their existence you know, by storytelling, you know, to exaggerate. And every Celt, I don't know where they're from, England, Ireland, or Scotland, or Wales. But Colin Keel was a real person, though. Oh, no he's doubt. A living in person, we have his grave, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Brilliant stuff. Thanks a million for your question, Kevin. Thanks uh, for letting me in. I'll mute. No problem. Uh, always a pleasure. Joan, Joan McHugh has a question. Joan, do you want to ask your question? How are you doing? Can you hear me? I can hear you I fine. Can. How are you, Joan? 
Hi, Jim. How are you? Um, I, I actually live on Bian Aether. I'm actually a resident of Holt, and my father is uh, an old boatman uh, going back God knows how long. Yeah. My daughter, my daughter has a house in Bian Aether, even though she lives in Italy. Oh, really? She rents it out, you know. Well, tell her I look after it for her then. <laughs> um, but listen, I'm just curious. A couple of things. Um, first of all, um, uh, no doubt you are aware of Lord of the Rings, etc., etc., and the myth. But um, do you think that the likes of um, Tolkien's characters were were of the likes of the Dedan and the Nem the Nemedians and the Urukai, the Urukai being the Fomorians, etc., uh, like the Dedanans being um, the elves, you know, with the blonde hair and etc., etc. Dr. Tolkien was a professor in Galway University, and he was. Pardon, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Say again. I'll, I'll lean forward a bit. We know that Tolkien was a professor in Galway University, right? We know he he described his own, the, the background of Lord of the Rings as based on the uh, structures in the Burren and that kind of countryside. And we know he took huge chunks, like the evil eye, Sauron. We know he took huge chunks of Irish and Celtic mythology. And there was no secret about it. He did it very deliberately, you know. So he was a yeah. brilliant writer too, you know. Absolutely fantastic. And the other thing I was going to say to you is, um, I, I, I noticed that you are, you come up, to host now and again I, I've seen your videos and uh, your Instagram where you'll take little snapshots have you been to what I would call uh, Dun Griffin, the real Dun Griffin not the Bailey Lighthouse but the real the Martello Tower No I've never been into Martello Tower, I've obviously gone up to it but I'm past it but never into it Now this is, <laughs> this is the one that is the uh, radio um Museum. Sorry, the radio museum. Sorry, I was thinking of the one on the other side. I know the one you mean. Sorry. Yeah, but it, to me, that? to me, I am absolutely one hundred and ten percent convinced that that is the real Dune Griffin. Oh, absolutely! I wouldn't argue with that at all. There yeah. Were two fortresses in Holt. One was there. Right? Yeah. The other one was where the lighthouse is. Yes. And then the siege of Holt. We call it a siege to it. Yes. And that. That whole structure was destroyed to build a lighthouse, unfortunately. You know? Correct. Yeah. The Hellfire was the massive monument we have up there. We're now excavating it. Mm. The Hellfire Club destroyed a really massive ancient structure, probably the size of Newgrave. Yeah. Absolutely. It would be wonderful to kind of get to the bottom of that now, if we could. I know there there have been digs. But uh, they can't. They can only go so far because I know the cliff face is very fragile. You know, for a start. It's, it's called an esker. Literally, you put a hole in it, and the whole thing goes. Yeah. Exactly, it's gone. Absolutely, yeah. It's lovely to meet you, Jim, and thank you, Anton. Thanks, Anton. Just, just one more, if we can. Diane Champagne is that uh, the right name there? D Diane, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Hi there. So nice to see everyone. Greetings from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Are you? So I'm Irish, Scottish. And there's an oral tradition of Dakota in my family. Dakota um, nation. Lakota. Lakota, da or Lakota, 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 Lakota. 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 With a D. Um, so I I have heard that the O negative blood is only only in common with First Nations people of North America and um, with Celtic, well, Celtic Absolutely. people. Um, You're quite so right, yeah. What would you make of that? Or do you random. have any? The first time I came across that was when I bought the Random House Encyclopedia. <clears throat> what is it? Let me get this right. The Reese's O positive, I think, blood group. Is oh, negative. Is oh, negative. O negative, is it? I get the O negative, yeah. But it's the only groups who have it in the abundance, right, as opposed to people who haven't got it, are Celtic peoples, North American uh, indigenous peoples, Eskimo, Aboriginal Australians, and the San people 
of the oldest people in Africa. That's what we all have in common. Some racial genetic connection, we don't know what it is yet. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, thoughts on uh, uh, old Irish mythology that could, li could link? Oh, absolutely. I think I gave the example very early on. <clears throat> I'm a, a fanatic of uh, Lakota and Dakota legends and lore. And I think I mentioned that the greatest warrior, Crazy Horse, mm -hmm. is, is a child, as a boy, yeah. is Satanta, right? Before he became yeah. a warrior. And to Cullen, mm -hmm. our greatest warrior, his name was Satanta before he became a warrior. So I think there must have been some kind of connection. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. I keep thinking, or something, but I don't think so. You know? I heard that there were sweat lodges in Ireland as well, but they were made of stone, where we make That's ours right. with willow. Yeah, they were called Fulta Fierce. They had two functions. One was to cook. You wrapped up bacon in straw and put it in the boiling water. And then you also had stones around that you could sit in there and sweat. Mm -hmm. But they were as sophisticated as the North American ones, mm -hmm. much earlier. I'll be coming to Ireland as soon as the COVID gives it a break. So I'm hoping to maybe visit with some of you and um, hopefully maybe you can make me friends on Facebook or something like that. I'm new to technology. Yeah, I'm an old one, girl. I'm, I'm friends with so many indigenous peoples. I uh, recently was involved, uh, oh, no, hold on, let me get this right, <clears throat> with the Choctaw and the Navajo. I'm working on a project at the moment to benefit the Navajo. The Choctaw Indians helped us during the famine. I don't know if you know that story. I know that, yeah. Recently, the Navajo have been hammered, and the Choctaw, with COVID. Yeah. Out of total proportion to their numbers, because they're genetically predisposed to getting it, I think, maybe like us. We don't know mm -hmm. yet. But they put a, a peel out, and they suddenly discovered over the first two weeks, over a million pounds million euros or a million dollars came from Ireland. They couldn't understand this it because we are trying to give them back. And now we have this connection with not just the Cocteau, which we've had for decades now, with the uh, Navajo as well, which is wonderful. Ever, ever thankful, ever thankful. Well, Thank we're thankful you. they did during, during the famine to help us during the Trail of Tears. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we won't get too political. We're just repeating. Uh, if you know what that is. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Jim, thank you very much for your time. It's an indication of how fascinating it's been by how quickly the time has gone by. Um, and as I said, I'd love to have you back again for another chat. Uh, and maybe. Well, we'll do that. No problem. Yeah, we'll, or we'll organize that. Uh, there's lots more to be talked about. In the meantime, all it remains for me to do is to say to everybody, do the usual unmute and say goodbye. <laughs> we do. We... Thank you, everybody, for looking in. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Next week's guest hasn't been confirmed yet, so we'll uh, we'll just keep following Mythical Ireland on Facebook, and we'll announce next the next guest as soon as we have one. We are chasing several people at this moment. Um, I'm going to let a big one and watch some soccer. <laughs> in all honesty we could probably all just get together and talk and have a great time too if nobody shows up <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, true. Great great idea. Idea. that's true that's that's cool. Cool. Hi, Jim. thanks very much jim do it as a guest yeah Bob holds the tar out. hi tom hello, hello then ah, hello there jim. Oh, yeah. Hello, Hi, Anthony. Hello, Anthony. Hi, Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Hi, Brendan. That was cool. I'm going to leave. It you. was. We, we, that was wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.
to everybody. Thank you. Thank pleasure, you. Jim. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Good night, all. Good night, Good night. everybody. Good night. So Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, right. Good, night. Good night, everyone. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much, Anthony. That was fantastic. Yeah, no problem. It, it was fantastic. I enjoyed that. Time flies when you're having fun, is what they say. Indeed. Indeed. It really does. <laughs> Um, it was brilliant, brilliant Anthony. More thank Zoom. you so much. Thank they're you, Tracy. Really popular, lad. Yeah, we're going to we're going to we're going to try and do one every week if I can. I just need to line up guests for them. That's all. So we'll we'll try and keep them going for at least once a week for the next while, anyway. So. That's but good. An Anthony, it really is a good idea that uh, I I can't remember who had that. If we all wanted to get together and just have a little chat. You know about that was me. I like to chat. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think Jones. Right. I can't see you. Yeah, Desiree. It was Desiree. I really like to chat to people. Hi, <laughs> Desiree. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And 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 Tracy, thank you so much for allowing me in tonight. <laughs> I I'm I'm useless at technology. I'm so bad. I'm so sorry. I was knocking at the door at something like a quarter past seven or something. <laughs> well, oh, you thank you so much. <laughs> Good night, everybody. See okay, you. Good night, John. Good night. 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 See you. Right. Telemat is there as well. I didn't even know you were there. Um, if, Tracy, thanks for your mm -hmm. help, and I know you've had a long day, so we'll let you go. And uh, no we might see you. Uh, yeah, we'll see you maybe once, maybe once. Maybe once. Maybe once. The mother live stream, right. but in the meantime, uh, from Mythical Ireland, live Irish myths in conversation with Jim Fitzpatrick. Uh, Thank each you. Of us of long Good day. Day. Good. 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 Good.